ओम वसुदेव सुतम देवम कंसचाणूरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गुरु okay. we were on the 6th chapter we are about to start chapter 6 of the bhagavad gita i have a little personal fondness for this chapter because when i became a monk this was the first uh, chapter we, i was asked to memorize this uh, it depends on the swami under whom you start your training first so the swami under whom i joined the order he would ask us to memorize a verse of the gita uh, every day each, each of the novices but we would be given different chapters um um i don't know why he selected what the, the way he did but for me he selected the sixth chapter and i started with this and the sir verse first verse i memorized after joining the order was the first one we're going to do today so i have this little um uh, and the funny thing was there was another novice who had a hot temper so he was asked to memorize one verse and one verse only i think from the um, that verse yasman no dujate loka lokan no dujate cha ya uh, i think from the 12th uh, chapter um, one who is not disturbed by the world and one who does not disturb the world that that's the meaning of the verse such a one is dear to the lord and he had to recite that every night that <laughs> he was given one verse to do so the sixth chapter is on meditation if we remember chapter 5 ended with uh, a couple of verses on meditation we were told that um on verse 20 that you shut out the external world uh, control your breath do pranayama presumably sitting steady in a meditation posture and then withdraw your senses from the external world which just means don't pay attention to the external world shut down your senses as much as possible and then um, with the breathing even with the mind calm then you focus um, on your object of meditation and in this way attain samadhi and such a one easily attains to moksha so the um, introduction to meditation has been given or indication has been given that he is going to speak about meditation usually these chapters would start with a question from arjuna but you notice there is no uh, question from arjuna in this chapter uh, one reason could be that already sri krishna wanted to teach this so he has introduced it in the earlier chapter and he continues what he started in the, at the end of chapter 5 so chapter 6 is uh, the chapter on meditation before we launch into it a couple of observances uh, observations what meditation is and what it is not in vedanta um generally meditation is for many many things and it's not wrong that meditation is for relaxation it does relax one uh, a person um, i mean some of the most deepest profound relaxation you can have is in the experience of yoga nidra those who practice hatha yoga you have experienced yoga nidra extraordinary relax deep relaxation um it is good for combating anxiety it is good for uh, uh, fighting against depression it is good for fighting mood swings it's good for um for boosting immunity in the body from what i hear and what i've heard of uh, medical literature is is actually been studied um it's good for uh, focus before examination it's good for relaxation after examinations so meditation is good and it's a good tonic for the mind morning and evening um but all of that is not the concern of meditation proper 
all these techniques of meditation, which all the benefits I mentioned are true. They do give all these benefits. It's true. There's no doubt about it. But that's not the purpose of meditation. If you go to the manuals of meditation, the most ancient texts like the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, which is the classic manual of meditation, the purpose was always spiritual. Uh, it was God realization, enlightenment, uh, self realization, whatever you call it, but spiritual. That was the purpose of meditation. And uh, um, spiritual ultimately means liberation in the terms we are using in Vedanta. Uh, it means moksha, liberation. So the purpose of meditation is spiritual. And in spirituality also, meditation is used in different ways. Um, in uh, Vedanta, what ex exactly, what does meditation do? Advaita Vedanta. We'll talk about that before entering this chapter, just to give a, get a perspective. So um, even in, in the, all of spiritual life, meditation has different, um, it's viewed in different ways. The purpose of meditation, what is the goal? What is the point of meditation? Techniques are many, but what's the whole purpose of this practice? This, uh, we may in general say, well, if it's for spiritual life, let we can also safely presume it is for liberation, moksha, salvation, uh, freedom, whatever you call it. The answer is no, it is not. No practice can give us freedom or moksha. And we are talking in the Vedantic context now. Uh, whatever be the way it is understood in other systems of um, in meditation in different religions, within Hinduism, outside Hinduism. But in Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, no practice, including meditation, can give us moksha because moksha is our very nature. The Atman is ever free. We are already free. Um, Atman was never born, was never bound, never experienced bondage. Um, so, in fact, never was in ignorance either. So none of this uh, is... Is you know for none of these things is meditation necessary to give freedom to us. Freedom cannot be attained because for the simple reason it is already it's ever attained. We are the very nature of the Atman is freedom. So meditation does is not meant to give us moksha. Um, then what is the problem? The problem is ignorance, and we know that uh, avidya or ignorance of our real nature is the problem, and Vedanta proposes to solve it through knowledge. So the next thing would be, yes, so that's what we mean. Meditation is meant to give us knowledge, self-knowledge, knowledge of Brahman, knowledge of Atman, enlightenment, whatever you call it. Meditation is meant to give us that kind of special spiritual knowledge. Again, the answer is no. Meditation is also in Vedanta, is not supposed to give us uh, that uh, spiritual knowledge or, or Vedantic realization. That point also has to be understood. Knowledge. Jnana or technically in uh, Vedanta Prama, not only Vedanta, Indian philosophy, Prama. Prama means knowledge or valid knowledge, is always a product of Pramana, a source of knowledge. So an instrument of knowledge generates knowledge. For example, eyes are the source of the, uh, the knowledge called vis visual perception, seeing of forms is due to the eyes. The instrument called the eyes will give us that. Mind plus the properly functioning eyes. And of course, there must be light and there must be the object which is fit to be seen. And then the eyes can see it. But basically, the eyes are the instrument and they give you the kind of knowledge called visual perception, seeing, to put it in simple terms. Ears for hearing. So the sense organs are the sources, are the pramaras, instruments of knowledge for uh, what is called perception. In Sanskrit, pratyaksha. Aksha literally means the eyes, but in general, it stands for all sense organs. Um, so, Pratyaksha, Aksham, Aksham Prati in Sanskrit. Each perceptual in instrument has its own kind of perceptual knowledge. But all of them are perceptual knowledge. Directly, you can experience something. See, hear, smell, taste, touch. Of course, there's always the possibility of error. But as long as things function well, you could expect valid knowledge. And then there is... Um, there is uh, inference uh, using uh, logic, um, the way, you know, 
in Greek logic, it was deductive and inductive inference. Uh, in, in Indian philosophy, it is called anumana. By seeing something, we infer something further. So there is smoke out there, it means there is fire. I don't see the fire actually, I see just the smoke. So seeing the smoke is perceptual knowledge, but by that perceptual knowledge, I can use my, uh, my background information which I've got and my understanding and I deploy a new method of, a uh, new instrument of knowledge called anumana or inference. And I infer a further piece of knowledge that there is fire there, which I don't see. How do I know there's fire if I don't see it? By inference. And there are other uh, sources of knowledge. What is of interest to us is the source of knowledge, which is called Upanishads. The Upanishads are taken as a specific kind of knowledge, which is not inferential knowledge, which is not perceptual knowledge. Of course, you have to read the Upanishad, or hear the Upanishad, that's there. But uh, the knowledge contained in the Upanishads is um, a revealed knowledge, like a scriptural knowledge. But here one must be careful. When we say scriptural knowledge or revealed knowledge, in India, it has always been understood that the scriptural knowledge or revealed knowledge points to a direct experience. It shows you something that you did not know or realize earlier. It's not meant, as it is generally understood, in something to be believed in. Just as when the eyes show you something, uh, I see the computer and I see all these people on the screen. Now, uh, am I supposed to believe it or I said, I know it? Before I saw you all, I, would, I could have said, I believe they are on the screen now. But now that I see you, I don't use, it would be odd for me to say that I believe you are on the screen. As I see that you are on the screen, I know that you're on the screen. There's a distinction between knowing and believing. So the Upanishads are a special instrument of knowledge, which will enable us to say, I know that I am Brahman. I mean, within quotes, there are technical difficulties involved there, but I realize that I am Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi is knowledge for me, not believing. So these Upanishads, it's like this. Eyes plus mind reveals to me forms. Ears plus mind reveals to me sound. Um, mind plus inference reveals to me the fire that is to be inferred by seeing the smoke. I'm just using an example. Inferential knowledge accounts for a vast amount of our knowledge. And there are other sources of uh, knowledge in Vedanta, uh, Advaita Vedanta. There is Upamana, there is Arthapatti, uh, Anupalabdhi. I'm not going into those. But the primary source of knowledge which we are interested in is Upanishads. It is called Shruti, uh, the, the Vedic revelations. So Upanish mind plus what will reveal to me that I am Brahman? So mind plus Upanishads, not mind plus meditation, not mind plus puja, not mind plus japa, not mind plus belief, not mind plus Shit Shashan or, uh, you know, uh, Surya Namaskar. No, no amount of religious rituals, no amount of secular work, no amount of physical exercises or breathing exercises or mental exercises will reveal to me that I am Brahman because they are not meant to, they are not instruments of knowledge. This is, I'm telling you the Vedantic framework. In Vedantic framework, Upanishads are regarded as the instrument of knowledge which reveals to me that I am Brahman. That's the purpose of the Upanishads. Um, how do they reveal? So every instrument is a way of, way of using it. Eyes have to be open. You know, you have to pay attention to what the eyes are showing you and you have to focus your eyes on what you... If you say, look here, uh, there is this person and the person you're showing it to maybe a little kid doesn't look where you want the kid to look. So the, the kid has got eyes, but the kid won't see because the kid is looking somewhere else. So yeah, there's a way of uh, deploying the instrument of knowledge. Um, so the ways of seeing, of hearing. Uh, I was um, reading this uh, story about a, a famous music composer. Um, I forget the whole context. But the student writes that we were told um, to listen to this um, music teacher playing um, a certain piece on the piano. And then hearing the same piece played on, on a cassette tape in those days. That recording was made by one of the great, great uh, virtuosos, you know, like a grand master, maestro. And then the teacher said to the students, do you hear the difference? No, he's himself an expert. 
I mean, one of the top experts. I'm playing it to the best of my ability. And here is just a casual rendition by that legendary, uh, you know, piano maestro. Do you hear the difference? And then he says, if you do good, you can continue attending the class. If you do not, there are other honorable professions like a, being a shoe shine or something, <laughs> which is very, very contemptuous of, sure, of the shoe shine boy. But, but this is the way to deploy an instrument of knowledge. So much cultivation and refinement is necessary. So there is a way to deploy the instrument of knowledge called Upanishads. What is the way? The way we know is Shravana Manana Nididhyasana is to systematically study the way um, the Upanishads and associated texts, think about it deeply and then meditate about it. So knowledge um, is produced by instrument of knowledge. Meditation is not an instrument of knowledge. Uh, it is, if you noticed, I, I mentioned Shravana Manana Nididhyasana, study, contemplation, meditation. It's a part of the way of deploying the instrument of knowledge the instrument of knowledge itself is Upanishads. And the way to deploy it is to study it and to grasp what it is saying. So meditation by itself does not give knowledge. Um, so here you might uh, notice it's, it's a technical point, but it's important to notice. In the, way, in the spiritual path which emphasizes meditation the most, which is Patanjali Yoga, there, um, there also, if you follow it closely, at no point does Patanjali say that meditation will give you liberation. Patanjali says that meditation will give you, um, what will give you liberation is uh, the knowledge of the separation, of the distinction between consciousness and matter. Uh, purusha prakriti viveka khyati. This is the sense, the technical term. Viveka khyati means the illumination or the revelation of the distinction between consciousness and matter. You are consciousness. Therefore, you cannot be the world. You cannot be the body. It's matter. You cannot even be the mind, which is matter. You cannot even be life, which is still matter. And when you see this distinction, you are ipso facto free of nature, of material nature. Coronavirus can't do anything to you, to you consciousness. It can do a lot to your body, to the body, to the, you know, to the living system there. But consciousness itself, it's distinct. So this distinction is not clear to us at all. We are so mixed up with it, with the body mind, that whatever happens to the material part of our nature, we think it's happening to us. Notice, we say, I'm saying material part of our nature, but I have no nature, actually. I am consciousness, and nature is not mine. And nature is an independent entity which cooperates with consciousness. This is the Sankhyan view and the yogic view. So the point of yoga is Vyoga. <laughs> yoga means union, but in Patanjali Yoga, it means Vyoga. It means the separation or the clarity. We have, in confusion, mixed up matter and spirit. The clarity of the distinction between consciousness and matter, this is uh, Patanjali Yoga. And that um, meditation cannot do. Only knowledge can do that because the problem is ignorance, mixing up two which are not actually mixed up. And that ignorance can be removed by knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Knowledge of the distinction between consciousness and matter. It may sound familiar to many of us because this is the first step in Advaita Vedanta. We have always thought of this as the first step. So this, the Drig Drishya Viveka, for example. So even their meditation is not going to um, uh, separate consciousness and matter. But what will meditation do then? Why is meditation stressed so much in Patanjali Yoga? Because it gives rise to that knowledge, that Viveka Khyati, between consciousness and matter. Purusha Prakriti Viveka. Purusha is consciousness, which you are, and Prakriti is the entirety of the universe, up to mind. But Vedanta disagrees here. Vedanta says even that knowledge, it comes from the Upanishads. It, it does not come from the meditation itself. Meditation can only help. So, so even from a Vedantic perspective, even knowledge is not coming from meditation. Moksha is not coming from meditation. Knowledge is also not coming from meditation. In Vedanta, meditation is not for Moksha. 
meditation is not for uh, jnana also uh, meditation is not for visions of devatas meditation can deep meditation can give you um, a vision of your ishta devata it is uh, entirely possible but that's not the purpose of meditation in uh, advaita vedanta uh, meditation is certainly not for generating uh, spiritual powers occult powers because meditation can do that patanjali yoga clearly mentions a whole chapter on all sorts of extraordinary superpowers you can get and you can easily be part of you know marvel comics dc comics uh, and uh, like be a superhero but that is uh, uniformly condemned in all the uh, in in spirituality in all religions in all religions both um, you know in uh, christianity in uh, judaism uh, islam and or in indian religions definitely buddhism the buddha took a very harsh view of any monks who uh, di- uh, displayed these powers these powers generally come on the spiritual path and they can actually be cultivated and meditation can cultivate it so all of these things which i'm saying meditation is not for this not for that all of these things are possible with meditation but not in vedanta it, it's uh, vedanta is very clear about it. these are not the purpose of meditation vedanta we'll see come to it what it what meditation is i remember about uh, so in my early days as a, as a novice about around the time when i was starting this chapter <laughs> um Uh, another so this is in deoghar there is a very ancient shiva temple there called vaidyanath dham very very old um it's an extraordinarily spiritual spiritual place and very powerful and uh, uh, in spring millions of people gather there i hope they don't do it this time there is a terrible coronavirus pandemic there um and there are all sorts of yogis and um, you know sadhus and uh, baba ji's who come there they sense the power of the place and they have a not that is relevant let me just mention the first thing that will strike you if you go there is the, it's a typical hindu structure with the central deity in the middle it's a small temple actually and uh, the other deities all around the smaller temples all around it so shiva's temple vaidyanath is shiva so shiva's temple is in the middle and then there is a temple of the divine mother of ganesha of uh, and you know uh, all other deities all around now there there is you will find streams of like um, uh, strings colored threads from the top of the temple of uh, vedanath shiva to the top of the temple of uh, the divine mother parvati so they are, they are uh, you will see hundreds of hundreds of multicolored like streamers are there uh, the idea is that people go there with uh, wishes and the wishes are always worldly wishes almost always i think 99.99% don't very few will go there for moksha or brahma gyana as as a wish though the monks do go there for that now those who go there with a particular worldly wishes see how it works the idea is shiva is brahman satchidanand the existence consciousness place now that is the reality of this universe and you're praying to shiva let it be like this you know um let my corona will be cured or let me get a job or something um or let my children be married some some kind of worldly big issue in in the family or let me let the fields yield plentiful next year so once you've done that then you have to go to the divine mother's temple and offer the same prayer and then you have to connect the two with that colored streamer <laughs> the uh, this nobody explained this to me this much is true everybody knows this but what would be the underlying uh, idea behind it shiva and shakti so shiva being satchidananda is the reality everywhere if your fields are fallow and there's a famine it's the same satchidananda and if your fields are bountiful and there is a bumper harvest and you are rich it's the same satchidananda from from the perspective of brahman nirguna brahman uh, satchidananda there is no difference at all it's just the play of maya uh, brahman is perfectly happy no but we are miserable in certain circumstances and we are happy in other circumstances so if we want to be happy and we want a set of circumstances which make us happy 
the 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 officer in charge of that department is the divine mother who can fulfill our wishes all our wishes are think let things go this way or rather than that way so the divine mother everything from uh, uh, you know get, becoming rich and married and uh, uh, you know becoming famous and winning the election and uh, yeah the politicians are big uh, they they make a b line for it before uh, before every election two monks praying for enlightenment so <laughs> uh, uh, all of them they they depend on the divine mother whether it's a spiritual wish or a worldly wish so you have to connect the divine mother to uh, to shiva because then uh, uh, it, it it will be shiva will manifest through maya in the way you want it to to happen that's the idea basic idea i think that's the just sort of the paradigm and it it's there's a cute ending to that story that uh, if your wishes if and when your wishes are fulfilled you come back to the temple and one day some day in your life uh, or even sometimes people pass it down to the children or grandchildren to come back and uh, untie one of those streamers where you connected so nowadays it might be wifi but in those days you had to have a like a cable connection between the divine mother and uh, shiva and there is a dedicated uh, family of priests not everybody can climb the temple so there's a dedicated family of priests for who for hundreds of years only the uh, the boys of that family are allowed to climb on the temple and they are incredible they climb up those the sheer walls the the walls of the temple are like this I and mean, they just hold chains and they run up the literally run up the you know vertically like this uh, and they connect the uh, the streamers from one uh, temple to the other and they'll run across the courtyard to the divine mother's temple and then they connect it there now in this comes a wild variety of spiritual practitioners my story is a long winded story but the point of this is once came a uh, a brahmachari a very extraordinary uh, brahmachari he was a part of our order at one time but he left um, and he had come there to practice meditation and he used to come to our ashram which was near the temple so we were quite impressed by him because he was so austere and he spent all his hours in in the temple meditating he was extraordinary looking also i think he was ab- around 7 feet tall he towered ab- above the rest of us was skinny tall and uh, um rather formidable looking he hardly spoke he had wild long hair and you could see him i mean he looked like one of those deities sitting there he would see sit in the corner and all day long he would meditate whenever he went and uh, he would come to our ashram sometimes one day we heard our head the swami in who under whom we had joined i heard him scolding this brahmachari fiercely i never heard the swami um, sh- raise his voice you know and he was literally shouting at him and then i saw this brahmachari striding out and he was in tears and he, and he left and i never saw him again later i asked the swami what happened it seemed that this brahmachari had been uh, practicing he, had, he was convinced that there was some specific powers he wanted to develop and he had been doing that and he finally could perform certain miraculous act i don't know whether it's a levitation or mind reading or what and in delight he came to the swami thinking the swami would be happy with him and he demonstrated it and the swami, swami scolded him so harshly <laughs> that the brahmachari left in tears so anyway the long and short of it meditation in vedanta is not meant for acquisition of those powers people might be mistaken there are many many monks who do that even the kumbha mela and all you come across these monks who are seem to be doing lots of meditation but they're doing it to acquire certain powers um i remember meeting someone who straight away read my mind and i asked him what does your guru say about these powers and he smiled and said guru says they are nonsense but he could i mean i just to for my, to convince myself i asked him what's on my mind right now and he told me so these powers are there but um, um they come in spiritual life they come but meditation is not meant for that but meditation will generate those powers uh, why i'm going on and on is i've come across these uh, several times in my life 
and uh, i've always seen in one case i saw a young monk who developed the powers of in just looking into other people's minds and uh, it, the power was uncontrolled so he couldn't deploy it at at will but he just began to know things which were not is impossible for the for him to know and then he asked a senior monk what he should do and the senior monk said stop meditating for a few days um uh, in in um, swami vivekananda's life also these things happened and in so many such cases there's so many many cases so i guess it's almost impossible to um, you know like disbelieve these things i just i don't think they are supernatural i think they are natural just that we our definition of nature is still not uh, wide enough um then what is meditation for so by all of this one might think that so that i don't need to meditate no we need to meditate this all this discussion is just technical philosophical to be philosophically accurate if you are meditating and i'm sure most of you are i am too and we are supposed to continue that regardless of what uh, philosophical niceties are raised or so what is uh, vedanta what what is meditation meant for in vedanta two things in advaita vedanta meditation does two things one is preliminary one is advanced preliminary and advanced what is preliminary we have already done this when we study vedanta we hear about the four fold qualifications viveka vairagya shat uh, sampatti mumukshutvam the the discernment between eternal and non eternal this passion for the non eternal the six uh, disciplines and intense desire to be free in the six disciplines one of them is samadhana focus staying with something settledness literally samadhana means samadhi being absorbed in meditation so this power of focus in fact all the six disciplines they are all meant to develop this power of focus this one pointedness this ability to grasp something deeply deeply and hold on to it and be absorbed in it in fact if you look at the six treasures uh, shama calmness of mind dhamma physical calmness calmness of uh, control of the organs of uh, action uh, and sense organs also and then and there is titiksha a fortitude don't be restless don't be upset by the problems that the world throws at you that people throw at you your own body throws at you uh, even the mind throws at you don't be upset by that well, kind of toughness hold on to this practice for the rest of your life then the third one is um uparati to withdraw from too much involvement or activities in the world and then the f- um, fifth one is samadhana focus the sixth one is shraddha a faith in this um, teaching in the teacher in the tradition which enables you to hold on notice all of these six are basically meant for focus they all help you in focus that's the whole point of them and then um, so that is one purpose that is the preliminary purpose of meditation in advaita vedanta and this preliminary purpose is fulfilled in all of in many of our lives uh, either we have got mantra diksha many of us we have got mantra diksha uh, we have got an ishta devata and vedanta fully approves of this because the first thing it will do for vedanta is it will give you adhikari it will make you a qualified a qualified student of vedanta one of the most powerful ways of becoming a qualified student of vedanta is to have an ishta devata to have an ishta mantra and to regularly do japa and dhyana morning evening sit and carefully do japa and dhyana these are powerful methods of acquiring four fold qualification um, sadhan chatushta specifically the focus required for um, vedanta this is called uh ekagrata focus of mind ekagrata it overcomes the problem called chitta vikshepa the uh, restlessness of the mind so restlessness restless mind overcome by focused mind if you be, it, it it brings to your mind certain uh, discussions in the past you are right we have discussed this again and again in the past so this is the preliminary purpose fulfilled by meditation at this level meditation is called upasana technically then you remember what happens in advaita vedanta the qualified student undergoes vedanta classes like we are doing um, upanishads gita uh, associated texts brahma sutras and other associated texts and uh, 
once you gather the teaching, you begin to understand it. All the elements are in place, which is why I'm taking up the Vedanta Sara classes. And it puts all those elements, a little bit of a dry text, but it put, puts all the elements at your disposal. Uh, if you consider them as a whole, you will begin to see most of the questions which come up. You can easily find the answer, or at least not so easily, but the answers are there. <coughs> then one goes into the second stage, which is clarifying, getting clarity. No doubt should remain. It should become absolutely clear that this is true. What else can be more obvious and more clear? So this clarity, this confidence will come through reasoning it out, asking questions and uh, resolving it in your discussions, in the classes, asking yourself also and finding it out. Some things only become clear with the passage of time. I have seen, I studied the books, talked with the teachers, attended the classes, but you know, it is our own experience. Weeks later, months later, it's, oh, that's what, that's what it was. Uh, so we get it. It takes time sometimes. Um, there's that famous verse that knowledge is acquired one fourth from the teacher, uh, one fourth by discussion with other, other students, you know, in, in the classroom, basically classroom environment, one fourth by your own efforts and thoughts, and one fourth in time. <laughs> time gives you the last fourth and completes it. So this is the second stage. It overcomes all doubts, gives you clarity. And then this clarity, it will mature into a living reality. Notice I'm using the words carefully. I'm not saying it's an, it'll be a new kind of spiritual experience, which I already said where meditation is not meant for that. I'm not even saying it will give you some spiritual power. It will give you knowledge. It will give you liberation. I already said meditation, not for that. What meditation will do is it will make it a living reality so that the, the problem which we face or often we raise, I get it, I'm clear about it, but it does not, my life is still continuing the, in the old mold. I'm unable to overcome suffering. I'm still reacting to the world as a body mind, you know, as this person. How do I overcome that? How do I be naturally identified as spirit and live my life accordingly? So Nididhyasana, Vedantic meditation at that level, makes it this Aham Brahmasmi knowledge, I am Brahman, it makes it natural. Just as right now I am this fellow Sarva Priyananda is natural to me. I don't have to do any spiritual practice for it. The daily morning once at, uh, and in the evening sit down so that I don't lose my grip on Sarva Priyananda. No. It's natural to me. Similarly, the realization that I am Brahman should be natural to me. Then it will be natural. Expressing it in life also will become natural. If you can express this knowledge in life, that is called Jivan Mukti. Liberate, liberated while free while living. Liberated uh, while living. Before the death of the body, can I live this life? So, for that purpose, there is Vedantic meditation. That's why at the end of uh, Vedanta books, Drik Drishya Viveka, it concludes with six techniques of meditation. Aparoksha Anubhuti concludes with 15 techniques of meditation. But you see, it boil, all of them boil down to the same thing. You realize something, you get clarity about it, the teaching is over, now stay with it. That is what Vedantic meditation is. So that's the second purpose of Vedantic meditation. One is a preliminary purpose, make us fit, focused, for Vedantic study and the second purpose is advanced purpose of meditation, Nididhyasana, which makes us, uh, which makes our, our study um, living, uh, you know, it becomes effective to remove the, the contrary tendencies of behaving like body mind, of behaving like a jiva, that is overcome by uh, the advanced practice of Vedantic meditation, Nididhyasana. So the two terms are Upasana, preliminary practice, and Nididhyasana, the advanced practice. This is the purpose of meditation in Advaita Vedanta. So it's a technical point. If you say that, oh, fine, I get it, but in Hindi they say, Moti Baad Bolo, tell us, the, oh, tell us the general conclusion. What's the point? Am I supposed to meditate or not? I don't understand all those five philosophical distinctions. Yoga, Sankhya, Vedanta, spiritual powers, what not? Should I meditate or not? Answer is, of course, one should. 
<laughs> Definitely one should meditate. One good way of solving these problems is looking at the lives of people you consider to be spiritually advanced. Do they meditate or not? Certainly they do. Almost always you will see they are very meditative people. Even after full enlightenment, Buddha, all his life, he meditated. Uh, he had this pattern of uh, engagement and withdrawal. So if you see the year, uh, if a daily life, start with meditation, then there would be engagement to some activity like, you know, um, talk to the big shoes. Then they would go out for begging for food. And they would come back and eat. And then they would withdraw again in meditation. And again, come forth and meet people who had come to meet them. Lay people, kings, poor people, they'd come. Then again, withdraw into meditation. So this, this is, was there and the meditation is there in the lives of all spiritual seekers. And seekers and uh, fully realized people also. So definitely we should meditate. Fine. Now, sixth chapter, chapter on meditation. Um, before going into it, Sri Krishna once again says, the preparation, meditation requires preparation. Why? For bhakti, nobody says you have to get prepared. Start straight away. Karma yoga, nobody says you have to get prepared. Start straight away. You're already doing karma. You have to convert it into karma yoga. We already have the power of you know, desire you need to convert it into love of God. And one can start doing it straight away and one should. Meditation, start doing straight away, not a bad idea, but it will not work. Meditation in, um, say, Patanjali Yoga, for example, is the seventh of eight limbs, eight steps or eight limbs. Ashtanga Yoga, the seventh one is Dhyana. So we try to jump straight into it and we expect meditation will be good. It's usually not good uh, because the mind is not prepared. How to prepare the mind? Sri Krishna has been talking about it since the second chapter. Chapter 2, 3, 4, whatever he has said. Five also he mentioned it. Karma Yoga. He says that is actually the foundation for meditation. So Karma Yoga is the foundation for meditation. Then the next level will be meditation. What kind of meditation? The preliminary focusing meditation. And then the next level will be Vedantic, uh, Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, including the advanced level of meditation. And this three-tier spiritual practice, um, converting action into spiritual practice, converting thought into spiritual practice, and then knowledge into spiritual knowledge, basically. You to look at it this way. Uh, this should sound familiar because we have come across it again and again. Now you can see why this structure has been set up. It's basically been uh, set up based on uh, an in implicit structure provided by Krishna and which he has taken its, its implicit in the Vedas themselves. Look at the structure of the Vedas. In the Vedas, are, we see it's divided into Karma Kanda, Jnana Kanda, but if you look even more closely, it is divided into Karma, Upasana, Jnana. Karma means rituals, Upasana means again work, action, but mental action, worship. And of course that worship is different from the deity worship which we have right now. That was a Vedic kind of worship. Um, but that was mental. So physical rituals, mental uh, meditative exercises, that's Upasana, and knowledge, Jnana, Upanishads. So the Vedas themselves had this three tripartite structure. And Krishna also has that same implicit structure in the Bhagavad Gita. That is later formalized into what I keep talking about, that three cross three matrix. So it is no wonder that while teaching uh, uh, meditation, before he starts, he's going to give us a couple of verses re-emphasizing that it's good to be a karma yogi before you start meditating. Let's start. Shashto Adhyaya, sixth chapter. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Anashrita Karma Phalam Karyam Karma Karotiya Sasanyasi cha yogi cha nani ragnir na chakriya. The Blessed Lord said, He who does the prescribed work without caring for its uh, results is a sannyasi and, and also a yogi, not he who is without the sacred fire and without action. So, what did Krishna say here? Basically, he said, A karma yogi is as good as you know, a traditional monk or a yogi. That's what he has said here. 
anashrita karma um karma yogi is describing here uh, in the way uh, what he's saying here is the general idea that people have of monks and yogis a monk is somebody just you see the picture the immediate picture that comes especially if you are from india is somebody who has walked up into the forest or the mountains uh, who wears a particular kind of dress and usually has either lots of long hair and dreadlocks or no hair at all uh, or and has uh, no job has given up his job no house um and no relatives no possessions so this is a monk sanyasi literally means the renouncer the all renouncer so he physically renounced all actions and the results of actions what are actions a job all the duties in the family these are laukika worldly actions there are also um religious actions like your regular pujas and uh, you know the rituals uh, traditionally the brahmins were um, doing the agni hotra rituals which was compulsory so that would that's what would have been meant here actually when uh, krishna said this niragni without the sacred fire what he is indicating is which was something prevalent and absolutely common uh, throughout society at that time you had worldly duties like arjuna would have had worldly duties you know as an administrator as a general uh, and as a family man also some uh, religious duties scriptural duties which would include the fire sacrifice and things like that and daily oblations to the sacred fire so that's the fire he 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 mentions here as a monk you give up all this you don't have a family you don't hold a job and you don't have that sacred fire you have given it up uh, because that is for the householder now you don't have the results of that also the structure is very elegant what are the results of that the results of a family job and the sacred fire are artha kama and swarga in this life you will get material wealth and prosperity and children and a family and progeny to to continue your family line and after death you go to heaven because you have accumulated enough good karma through that performances of the rituals so those will propel you to heaven uh, after death all of that you give up when you become a seeker of enlightenment which by the way you have sort of signed up for so you are giving up all the goodies now all of that and why would one give up that because ultimately they all are temporary and they do not lead to any kind of permanent happiness or satisfaction one sees through all of that and one one seeks the infinite the release from this cycle so if you give up a job if you give up a family and if you give up the sacred fire you're not going to get uh, money and a house and children and wife and husband and uh, and heaven after death all of that is gone uh, so that is the sign of a traditional monk and what is the sign of a yogi a yogi is somebody who sits in meditation and you know the general idea is uh who's very calm and the mind is in who's the is doing yoga meditation basically a peaceful mind and here krishna says the person who is actually doing all that who is in the middle of uh, family life and holding a job and uh, maintaining a sacred fire and uh, fighting even fighting a battle and uh, having a family is a sanyasi and a yogi how you can see the the paradoxical nature of the statement now how startling it appears so when you see the context you see uh, how how great it is that even as literature how great it is it starts with a bang uh, which is something that arjuna it's absolutely paradoxical for arjuna how is that possible this is completely contradicts what we think of uh, as a sanyasi and as a yogi how can you be in the midst of uh, all of this and be a sanyasi you have not given up he says no anashrita karma phalam without desire for the results of these activities not motivated by the desire for the results of these activities whether it is the the scriptural activities or your worldly activities you can still do your job and be in the midst of family and do even rituals 
even regular religious rituals you can do all of that but your purpose is no longer the same as the other people around you other people around you are doing it for worldly gains and other worldly gains and that's the whole purpose of it there's nothing more to it for them so like the millions who go to the baidyanath dham temple and put up those colored streamers 99.9% of them are going there for this only for uh, things of this world or things of the next world that's it but you are that point 001 percent you are still there and you're still doing the, those activities but now you are doing it for the purification of the mind so that you're ready for the next level in spiritual life which is meditation which i'm going to teach you and if you do it if you stay there and you do it you gain the qualification for vedanta and you are as good as a monk and a yogi so arjuna could explain we are also really curious yeah i understand you are advertising karma yoga that's great but aren't you overreaching yourself how is this person the same as a sanyasi sanyasi has given up this person is actually doing those things is actually earning money in a job um, in a family and even doing the sacred fire rituals or whatever how so he says the essence of giving up is giving up the motive behind that uh, the motive the monk gives up the actual action and the desire behind it the desire behind it is to enjoy um, you know worldly pleasures and go to heaven after that the monk has given up that that's the essence of giving up in uh, being a monk and therefore the monk has also given up the activities themselves they given up the activities given up the relationships given up the possessions and given up the desire behind those possessions if the monk has not given up the desire and has given up the external things only then he is not truly a monk and is asking for serious trouble because the desires are still in the mind you if you give up those desires and you can remain there you are as good as a monk sanyasa sanyasi because the sanyasi is is the one who has given up the desire for the the results the worldly and other worldly results so i'm when am i getting all these explanations shankar acharya he explains all this very nicely how are is he equal to a yogi because what is the distinguishing characteristic of a yogi what does what comes to your mind a peaceful person sitting in meditation so this person has given up the source of restlessness vikshepa hetu shankar acharya says chitta vikshepa hetu the source of restlessness of the mind is desire you have given up the this worldly pursuit the desire of worldly goals and you're doing your duty in the world in that case your mind will not be restless it will not be elated with one or two success a couple of good words a little bit of praise it will not be depressed while a couple of failures you're not doing it for success and failure in the world you're not desperate for success in in the world you're not terribly scared of failure in the world all you want is the the pure calm strong even mind which will be very useful for meditation in that case whatever you are doing in the world it will help you i remember in our order whenever we grumble i mean younger monks we can grumble to senior monks this is bad maybe the food is bad or um there's this classic story of uh, you know a monk who went to a monastery and joined and they were i think there was it was a medieval european monastery where you're not allowed to speak trappist probably and uh, you're allowed to speak only uh, one word in um in in 10 years or something like that and, and or 5 years so after 5 years this monk he had got he had earned his right to speak one word um so he went to the head of the monastery and he said bed that's it he can't say anything more and then 5 years later he comes and says hard <laughs> bed is hard then he goes back 15 years later uh, he has passed and then he says food five more years passed 20 years in monastic life he comes back and he says cold so bed is hard food is cold okay we've got the facts now 25 years later he comes to the head of the monastery who might have changed by that time now he's a senior monk himself 25 years later he says i am and then 30th year tier, he comes and he says to the head who might be younger than him by that time he says leaving so <laughs> 30 years it took him 
फूड कोल्ड बेड हार्ड आई एम लिविंग आई लॉस ट्रैक वाई वॉज एंग दिस because of this uh, mm you come back to me this is a problem with telling too many stories thank <laughs> you chikta vikshep hetu yeah so i was saying that the uh, thank you you're asking for trouble if desires are there in the mind this is asking for trouble what will happen is we will become some monk and then these problems are there in the mind and then um, uh, how will the monk meditate how will the monk meditate these uh, um, bad hard food cold issues will keep coming up in the mind the monk cannot meditate if these chitta vikshepa hetu these uh, causes of the fluctuations of the mind restless of the mind is gone then the mind will be calm um a monk in the himalayas said and i've repeated this earlier also on occasion i'll tell you in hindi and translate mahatma ji samadhi lagwana to aasan hai aapko 1 minute mein samadhi lagwa denge meditation is easy oh swami oh mahatma i'll give you samadhi in 1 minute this sounds like the typical you know uh, samadhi in 7 days crash course in meditation no he was serious monk said shart hai ki chitt shuddh hona chahiye i have only one condition come with a purified mind that come with a purified mind is a lifetime's work or many lifetime's work so that is what krishna is saying um with a, with the desire it's notice it's not purposeless work why would see the monk who gives up uh, everything because the monk does not want uh, children and uh, worldly pleasures and money and house does not even want to go to heaven after death and so he gives up all the activities which are associated with this and decides to meditate and pray and study it seems clear logical but then it does not seem clear why should if you don't want the results why should you remain in the world at all it's a very uh, it's a very obvious question and uh, shri krishna's insight the paradigm shift he brought around is actually remarkable when you appreciate it in that context um so even today i come across so many number of people who have asked me so i'm going away so serious spiritual life has started which means is making a b line for the himalayas giving up a good job in the united states or canada and retiring and packing up everything and off i go um, so i tell them to be a little more little cautious and try it out yourself once or twice first before you so anyway so it's the same question it's it persists even now krishna's insight was that you need preparation even to genuinely give up and be a monk like that it's not at all that easy you need preparation i see that how things have been made easier for um, novices to have ashrams to have to replace the samsara with karma yoga exactly what krishna has suggested the moment i enter my idea also was when i entered the monastery that i will um, meditate and pray and study vedanta and i will become illumined and enlightened so sort of some kind of vague idea was there like that and what i was made to do was just the opposite lots and lots of work uh, and when you would complain to the senior monk there's too much work and not enough time to meditate the answer would be good <laughs> good i remember one monk very brilliant man he he joined one of our order uh, ashrams in our order many years before me a senior to me a brilliant scientist trained in one of the leading universities in the united states with patents to his name so he gave it all up and he became a monk expecting so he will meditate and all of that luckily he joined the this very good order uh, so he was sent to one of our ashrams and then he wrote to the general secretary that there's too much work i'm working 12 hours or 14 hours a day this is there's hardly enough time for meditation and <laughs> general secretary wrote back a single line that i'm i'm very happy to know that you are devoting your time to the uh, service of sri sri thakur sri ramakrishna's service you'll be blessed by this so this is the idea and this is this incorporates sri krishna's great insight 
that karma yoga is essential for a life of meditation it's essential for a life of monasticism also as a preparation it, you cannot avoid this all right um oh we have run out of time let me just quickly look at the questions wikipedia oh uh, amijit has shared a picture from baba dham rick archer says if siddhis are verboten why does patanjali devote one chapter of a four chapter book to them true now patanjali himself warns against the siddhis he says it's only if you can go beyond them if you can reject them then the higher samadhis are open to you uh, maybe because the patanjali yoga sutra is a sort of very accurate phenomenological description of the path of meditation of the higher experiences possible in finer states of the mind which would include a lot of these experiences by the way again let me emphasize it's very easy to misunderstand or misconstrue what i said if the visions of deities these are very very powerful helps in vedanta also i said it's not the purpose of meditation it's not the purpose of meditation as far as attainment of brahma gyan is concerned but it is part of the process so if you have an ishta mantra and ishta devata the goal is definitely to get a vision of the ishta devata is it not that you said it's not a part of vedanta no 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 i never said that what i meant was that that will develop a mind which is for for which mind the vedantic realization will be easy will be far easier in fact in advaita vedanta this is called krita upasti krita upasti means a person who has completed every stage so a person who has completed karma yoga a person who has completed meditation to the level of having a vision of his or her chosen deity to that level for that person the classic example is sri ramakrishna so he had continuous unimpeded vision of his chosen deity kali mother kali and from there it took him just one effort to attain nirvikalpa samadhi it was like smooth for him to realize the, uh, that i am brahman so that's a of course an extreme demonstration of a kritopasti he always said that you need to do only 1/16th of what i have done um also these spiritual powers they are uh, forbidden uh, but one must admit that in the lives of uh, enlightened people and in our religious uh, scriptures in the documents in every religion there are uh, there are accounts of these that these were demonstrated and they did work and uh, even sri ramakrishna sort of tempted swami vivekananda he said look i have got all these powers so he said that whatever powers are mentioned ashta siddhis and all mentioned in the patanjali yoga sutras he, he said i have got all of them do you want them and um, swami vivekananda said will they help me to realize god become enlightened he said no but after you do notice the connection between what i said at the beginning that it's not the purpose of meditation to give you these powers he said no uh, but after you do become en- enlightened it will help you to in your teaching in your work and then vivekananda said he was narendra nath at that time he said that in that case let it be i don't want them now or i don't want them he said but he got them because uh, later on in, in america also there were numerous such incidents one disciple who came to him she notes rather sh- uh, that uh, you know he looked at me and then r- rather shyly he said if you permit me can i read your mind can i see into your mind <laughs> what an amazing thing that for us it's an amazing thing for him it's uh, he's rather sh- uh, you know like diffident about it i have myself met uh, a number of people uh, monks um, and non monks who definitely had some of these powers um in fact speaking to rick's question 
even the possibility of attaining uh, states of samadhi through drugs specific drugs is mentioned by patanjali this was a bone of contention between uh, the early movement of you know the lsd movement and all when um uh, aldous huxley and um and uh, um you know timothy leary um and ramdas not ramdas himself but timothy leary definitely and aldous huxley uh, against swami prabhavananda ji in hollywood prabhavananda ji took the orthodox trance stance that don't try these things and yet it's mentioned in the patanjali yoga sutra speech i think aldous huxley and swami prabhavananda ji translated together in fact recently um in a conversation at the organized by the harvard bookstore professor christoph koch christoph koch uh, he uh, he has been trying out those the, the silo uh, silocybin yeah and he also mentioned that these things are meant that uh, these are ways of attaining uh, higher states which are mentioned in texts and he himself t- talked about a number of experiences which he himself had so yes it's mentioned and also it's privated in the sense in the same breath that uh, this is not the way to attain uh, sustainable spiritual development so sustainable is the key word there then krishnamurti says um, vishwanathan krishnamurti vishwanathan says according to our advaita framework shruti pramana is essential for removal of ignorance deployed through shravana mana nidhyasan correct in the case of an example like ramana maharshi seem to have received this knowledge without the shruti is there a way to fit that into framework may any number of ways people <laughs> try to fit it into the framework like uh, he must have done all that in his past life it just uh, it bloomed or blossomed in this life who knows <laughs> but exceptions prove the rule so uh, the person one person becoming spontaneously awakened Uh, but the rest of us do not so we need some pointers which show us what they realized and it's possible and i do believe there are people more and more people who have got that awakening including some who get it spontaneously you cannot totally dismiss um, you know like uh, um the power of now um, and the gentleman um ekartole ekartole yes ekartole um i mean i have read it i have not met him personally but it sounds quite authentic and he is uh, i mean he has a, there's a very good feel to it very genuine feel to it and yet he had it completely spontaneous he has read vedanta but that's much that's afterwards after the initial breakthrough sri ramakrishna his initial uh, ecstasies were spontaneous as as a child then gloria says is it possible to renounce worldly desires through an act of self will seems impossible to me and renounce means make up your mind and if you are saying that it seems impossible no it isn't you have done it all of us have done it you're saying that no but the result the desires are still there that's a different thing the vasanas the conditioning of the mind is the material thing a physical thing it's like a recording in our uh, samskaras in our subtle body that will not go away immediately that's why karma yoga is necessary but the, the renunciation is an act of is a decision is a clear serious decision that uh, god realization is my goal satisfaction joy happiness lasting peace bliss overcoming suffering that's the general definition of the goal of all living beings from the person who's running after money to the person who's running after nirvana all of us are chasing the same thing but some are doing it more wisely than the others so why should it be impossible we are doing it all the time we are going from one level of understanding to a deeper level or a higher level of understanding throughout our lives i thought my happiness would be complete if i got that remote controlled car when i was a little kid and the, nothing else would be needed to be to add to my uh, to my happiness but i understood very soon 
that no, I need those Superman and Batman comics. And then I understood that I need to, you know, I need books which are for teenagers. And then I needed, I was interested in philosophy books and this and that. So what, what am I doing here? It's renunciation, basically. You are solidly moving ahead in life. Um, the things which you thought you really felt they will give you happiness, you see that they don't. Will it remove all the traces of desires? Not so, not so fast. It will take time. That's the whole of the, the process of spiritual purification. Chitta Shuddhi. Abhijit asks, it seems Sri Krishna in the first verse is telling us that Vyavaharic view of pure consciousness. We read that consciousness is, though filled in and through the waking world, is still perfectly asanga. And translated to a practical standpoint, this would mean work in life as earlier stated, uh, in life as earlier, but without attachment. Just like how philosophically the pure consciousness behaves. It's the right point of view to see the connection between karma yoga and jnana yoga. You are right, but that what you are speaking about is the final stage, uh, is the, the stage of a jivan mukta. This is not the meaning at this stage because you'll immediately see uh, in the third verse, Krishna will say, so this is preliminary. Now to go to a higher level, you've got purification of mind through this kind of a practice. The higher level will be meditation. But the higher level beyond that is the realization that all is consciousness. And then when you have realized that all is consciousness, you see the play of consciousness everywhere. Uh, so that's the Jivan Mukta level. Here it is, the, uh, it is reaffirming the teaching of Karma Yoga. Rick says, it seems that genuine saints sometimes perform siddhis, but they're discreet about it, not showing them, showing off or using them to attract crowds. Uh, yes, generally, I've, I've also uh, come across such cases where they have actually done something and then cautioned people all around, never to reveal this to other, others, and which they inevitably do. They go, the first thing they go is go on Twitter or something. <laughs> Nowadays, it would be immediately a worldwide sensation. That's why it's, um, saints are very careful because one thing they hate is drawing crowds around them. I, I once had a very senior monk. Uh, he's passed away, so I, I'm going to do the same thing of <laughs> broadcasting something he told me never to talk about. Uh, but he's gone now. So he told me about how he actually had a vision of Sri Ramakrishna. And, uh, it, and it affects when you hear it from somebody who has genuinely had such a, an experience. Even when he tells you, it creates such an impact on your mind. Let's see, even now I remember it so clearly. I can see the Swami standing there, the room, the look in his eyes when he told me. And uh, it was a very old Swami. And so now when I walked out of the room, he came to the door again, got up from the bed, and he came, walked to the door carefully, and, and again called me back and he said, don't tell anybody. <laughs> this is the first time I'm telling people. But of course, I'm not giving any details. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu